Okay. Well, we are live now. So I welcome all of you who have joined us for this uh, very special Wednesday colloquium today, um, where we are going to celebrate the work of Professor H. M. Antia, associate with TIFR for many, many years. Um, so as we all know, um, the Wednesday colloquium is a fantastic forum for all of us to get together uh, on a Wednesday afternoon at 4 p.m. and you know hear about the lots of very interesting science that's going around. And only a few of these times, we actually reminisce about uh, what was done and how, uh, how the historical course of certain ideas in one field emerged, okay? So today is one such special day. Um, we are going to have Professor H.M. Antia uh, disclose to us uh, 45 years of helioseismology, okay? So for that, let me first actually have my colleague, uh, Professor Shravan Hansoge, who is going to formally introduce um, Professor Antia. Uh, Shravan, please take over. Thanks so much, uh, Jyotishman. So I, I want to say right at the outset, it gives me simultaneously great pleasure and a twinge of sadness to introduce uh, Professor Antia at this colloquium. I'll explain the sadness part of it at the end. But uh, let me just say all the wonderful things uh, about Antia that uh, you know, we've all come become, those of us who know him are accustomed to. So before I joined TIFR, uh, I, I, you know, helioseismology of course was strongly connected to TIFR and so I was considering coming back to India. And I asked everyone, so what do you think? And uniformly people didn't know TIFR. They said, was this the institute that Antia is at? So, I was, that, that was what, I mean, numerous people from different countries would keep saying, oh, this is, the, this is Antia's Institute, right? This is Antia's Institute. So already I knew that I was coming to a, you know, a sterling place right there and that his reputation far preceded him. So I had never seen Antia before uh, I joined, uh, before in fact I interviewed in TIFR in 2013. Antia never travels, almost never travels rather, I should say. Uh, so I'd never seen him at an international conference, nothing. But despite all of this, uh, it's truly remarkable actually what someone who's just basically sitting in his office 80% of the time and a little bit of travel has been able, able to accomplish scientifically. So just to say a little bit about his science, he's made profound contributions to the understanding of the structure of the sun, now stars, and uh, now increasingly you know, X-ray uh, spectra and to understanding the X-ray universe and so on. Uh, it's a very wide gamut of research for, for one individual scientist. Uh, so that's very impressive. For, for a scientist, as I said, who doesn't really travel that much, it's, as we all know, is, uh, traveling is a critical part of uh, you know, spreading our ideas and so on. And uh, people take note of you when you do travel. But Antia, as I said, uh, repeatedly does not do that. And despite that, his age index is 43, which is uh, remarkable. When I joined, actually, uh, it, that was about seven years ago at TIFR, his age index was 35. Uh, you know, everyone was praising Antia. No one, of course, very few people had seen him, but everyone was praising him. I'd looked his age index up. That was in 2013. So, so it's risen by quite a bit uh, since then. Uh, so that, uh, you know, scientifically speaks a lot about how influential he's been. Um, just a little bit about his contributions to TIFR as an institution. We're very lucky at TIFR, uh, you know, the institute at large and our department uh, in particular that Antia, that such a, such a remarkable ind individual such as Antia was with us for all these years. He takes great care uh, to ensure that things are done fairly, that uh, the rules and uh, the reputation of the Institute are, are you know, foremost of foremost importance to him. And uh, I, I, I think uniformly, despite agreements, disagreements of all of us have had with Antia over the last several decades, almost every one of us will agree that he's a very fair person. He doesn't have an agenda to grind. He doesn't have an ax to grind. He uh, is a very, very kind and very generous person who's, who's been able to bring people together to the basis of, you know, this, these are the principles by which we should conduct our science, by which we should conduct ourselves. And uh, has, uh, I think, you know, been quite a remarkable person in that context. Um, he's, uh, he's been in, uh, you, you know, he's never shirked from any duty that concerned TIFR. So he's been, as uh, Devendra Oja, our colleague was telling me, he's basically been on every single, served in every single committee at TIFR that, that he could think of. He's been the you know, uh, lead security, uh, things are very disparate things that, that are, you know, very disconnected from his major research uh, areas. He's taught very well, he's written a, uh, you know, widely quoted textbook. So he, you know, he sort of really covered the range of what it means to be a good scientist, a good teacher, a good administrator. So 
we will definitely, definitely miss that as our kids retire. And that was the part about the sadness that I was saying. We're, we're all, I think many of us are regretful that he, you know, he won't be our colleague uh, at TIFR any longer. Of course, some, some place else will have him and they're very lucky, they're going to be very lucky to have him. Um, uh, just a little bit also about uh, uh, him as a, as, a, as a person, as an individual, as a colleague with whom we worked. He's, uh, as I said, he's very nonpartisan. He's very reluctant to, you know, uh, push uh, any agenda. So much so that uh, in one of these uh, departmental meetings when we uh, graded our student seminars, uh, Antia's uh, own student, he was, uh, he was, you know, he was too shy to say, oh, this guy gave a great talk, so I'm going to give him an eight and a half on 10 or something. So it was the entire department who had to push this, his student to say, no, no, he, he gave a really good talk. And that I think uh, we were all amused by it because Antia is so careful in, in ensuring that he's, he's being fair, that he, you know, he, he really is qu quite, a, a, quite impressive in that uh, context. Uh, a very last uh, personal side note uh, about him, uh, not many of you may know this, but Antia is also very, very fit. He walks uh, aggressively. So I heard this when, you know, a few years into TIFR, so I, you know, I was astounded. One day, apparently, he set out to meet a friend in Dadar. So, of course, most of us would have taken, uh, you know, some form of public transportation or, or a taxi or something. But Antia said, okay, well, why don't I just walk to Dadar? So apparently, he walked to Dadar. He met his uh, friend or colleague there and then decided, you know, it's, it's, been, it's a perfectly pleasant day, so let me continue walking. So, and there was a, there was a meeting or something in uh, Pune the following day. So he walked 160 kilometers from the tip of uh, southern tip of Bombay uh, to Pune on the old Bombay Pune highway in a, in a period of 24 hours. So he's uh, given to all these quirky, uh, uh, you know, uh, habits and and uh, as I said, we, we've had uh, for many of us it's been a great privilege and pleasure to have served alongside him, done research with him. I hope to continue uh, my my own collaboration, our group's collaboration with him uh, in the coming years. I believe, I've heard that uh, there are rumors that he will continue to be in Bombay. So this is uh, something that is very, uh, it, that made me very happy to hear. So we'll continue to look forward to see him in some capacity or other. Uh, and on that note, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Antia to give this uh, talk. One last thing I want to say, I actually, as I said, I hadn't really seen him or heard uh, his talks very much, but uh, we had invited him to a conference uh, three years ago in 2018 to give a talk on convection in the sun. It was a superb talk, actually. I was quite, uh, uh, you know, taken by his talk at the, le the level of, um, you know, his didactic abilities and so on. So I, I think we'll all, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk. I'm sure it'll, it'll be a splendid uh, discourse on Helios seismology. Thanks very much, Antia. Very nice, Rowan. Thank you for doing it. Uh, Antia sir, you can start and you tell me when you need help with the slide change. Okay. I'll, I'll still give you one hour after Shravan's half an hour, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, so thanks for the opportunity to talk to you people. Now, of course, I should first say that, and of course, Shravan for the introduction, of course, all the things which he said were not quite true, but nevertheless, that is the case with all these uh, things. So. Now, of course, you have all, I suppose, many of you have heard a wonderful colloquium by Sarvani Basu some more, a little more than a month back on a very similar topic. So I have tried to make that there is not much overlap between the thing, but nevertheless, there could be something. Now, at least she had anyway given a good introduction to the helioseismology, so I can probably skip some of that. And of course, more importantly, this talk is basically some, I will tell a few stories. So they are somewhat disconnected. So if Jyotish Man feels he can stop me at any point, and I think it will not be a problem. So let us now go to the next slide. Yeah. So historically, of course, the solar oscillations uh, with a period of about five minutes were actually discovered by Lighton and his colleagues in 1963. But that time it was not clear what those oscillations represent and a number of theories were put forward to explain those things. So this uh, went on for some years and it was in 1970 that Ulrich and 1971 Leibacher and Stein both independently proposed that these are acoustic modes trapped below the solar surface. So basically these are the modes of normal oscillations of the sun. Now, of course, saying that is, does not really help because one has to show that that is the case. 
so that had to still wait and it was only by the pioneering observations of Dugner in 1975 who did more detailed observations to study these oscillations including some information about the spatial scales that that confirmed this nature as the acoustic mode so that uh, so from a hindsight we can say that can be considered as the beginning of helioseismology so this was this paper came in november 1975 so you are just uh, completed 45 years from that and that also happens to be the year when i joined tifr so of course i joined in august so this was a little few months after that of course i did not see the paper immediately i saw it much later that's a different story now the term helioseismology was probably first used by severny this is a russian group in 1979 so ironically this was used in connection with 160 minute oscillation now that oscillation hasn't survived the test of time but the term helioseismology has survived so that is the thing so we can go to the next slide One slide back. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So now during the early days, the helioseismology, there was not much diagnostic potential because the frequencies were not determined accurately. And of course, many of the frequencies did not even survive the test of time. So during 1975 to 80, Actually, we were studying the properties of acoustic and magnetoacoustic waves in solar atmosphere, mainly using polytropic models. And of course, part of the reason for this was the limited computing resources. Because when I joined the institute uh, and started working initially, the computers, of course, the computers were very big. They filled the entire hall, but their capacity was not uh, that large. And more importantly, we were forced to use uh, punched cards to feed the programs. There was no other access to them. And that was not a very efficient way because we would take a few hours to get the output after feeding the program. And then we may discover that there was some error while compilation or some cases even the card reader didn't read the card properly and so on. So it was, and of course, after some time, we did get access to the terminals and there was some hard disk where we could store the files. But of course, we had a princely capacity of 512 kilobytes to store the entire whatever program data, everything. So that is the limitation. So we were not doing very serious computation in those days. Now, in the early days, this focus was more on driving of driving mechanism for the oscillation and uh, endo and osaki just soon after the discovery of uh, i mean soon after jubner's result proposed that these oscillations could be self-excited it is just like the pulsation in c fields so we actually extended because it happens that the driving mechanism in c field doesn't really work on sun because sun is outside the instability strip so that was recognized. So we actually extended this study to include the effect of convection in 1980s as the radiative processes were not enough. Now, of course, including the effect of convection is not straightforward because even in the steady state, it is not really possible to calculate the convective flux. So when we are considering time dependent situation, there is really no known way of doing it so we just made some assumption and did that thing so nevertheless so now we can go to the next slide yeah so this uh, required first of course this required the calculation of a realistic solar model because we had to study the modes as it happens in the sun so for the equations of stellar structure can be integrated but it also requires other inputs like equation of state opacities and so on the equation of state is somewhat straightforward to calculate. You use the SAS equation to calculate ionization, etc. Now, opacity is more difficult to calculate. So we had extensive tables of opacity. So but only thing is they had to be typed because these tables were those days published in. Uh, what is it? Yeah. Any question? OK. So is, that, is that a question? OK, no, I think 
on the subcontinent okay so those days of course this tables were typically published in astrophysical journal supplement series so pages of those tables had to be typed and of course uh, this is, around that time it was also recognized that the main source of opacity in the solar atmosphere is actually the h minus that is the hydrogen atom with one electron added and the vardia had calculated those opacities and we had to use those opacity table and we also use the krishna swami ski tau relations now i am saying this because both this people were actually members of daa at that time and of course they have obviously done a pioneering work but for some reasons their work is not well recognized even within daa so that is the reason why i am just saying this of course the vardia opacity tables have been superseded by better tables but krishna swami ski tau relation is even today used in almost every stellar evolution code so that was the contribution they had no before all this uh, goldreich and kile in 77 had already proposed that these oscillations could be stochastically excited by turbulent convection so which means they are not self excited but there is an external driving happening so external means of course still this is within the sun but slightly decoupled from that so there is some driving force which gives it so now of course there was still a debate about which mechanism is valid and this issue was resolved in the middle of 80s or so in favor of stochastic excitation because by that time it was known that the amplitude of oscillations was very small around that initially of course it was difficult to measure the amplitude reliably because period can be measured easily by taking a fourier transform but amplitude is not so easy to get because various transformations had to be applied so this was found that amplitudes are very slow small in fact individual modes have an amplitude velocity amplitude of about 10 cm per second so that is too small because in a if they are self excited then the amplitude will grow exponentially with time and it will keep increasing until some non linear effect comes into play to limit the amplitude so but at 10 cm per second it is difficult to imagine any non linear effect which can limit the self the amplitude for example in cfids the amplitude is several kilometers per second the velocity amplitude so this is clearly different from that so it was clear that the stochastic excitation must be working so that was there but that of course didn't mean that all our work went to waste because we could still calculate the damping so basically what we did is we improved the treatment of convection basically not so much in improvement treatment of convection but basically increase the turbulent velocity so the turbulent viscosity so that made the mode sol stable and once that happened then you can actually calculate the damping time which can be actually compared with the line widths of the mode which of course was not possible for the stochastic excitation because they cannot get the lifetime of the modes so and apart from that the same formulation was also used to study solar convection so that was our effort in the beginning so now let us go to the next one next slide yeah so one of the first conferences dedicated to heliosismology was held in 1983 at catania no of course shavan said that i don't attend conferences but actually i did attend this meeting and it was quite uh, exciting because that was the time when the results from solar oscillations were coming of course not all of them survived but nevertheless various things were presented and i don't think there was much by the way of real inferences that was presented there but there was of course a the main highlight was a talk by douglas goff so he basically told what all can be done with the data that is expected to come of course at that point i didn't realize that much but looking back at it i think if we look at what has happened in the next 30 years most of it was pointed out by him at that point and apart from that we were also treated to a live demonstration of the real seismology because the mount etna which overlooks catania was actually erupting at that time that is one of the active volcanoes 
and of course I had the occasion to actually see the lava flowing through that. So that was the real seismology. <laughs> so that was that. Now, of course, uh, as I told you, the accurate measurements of oscillation frequencies were carried out in 1980s. But of course, in that, those days, uh, of course, this uh, astronomy did not have the tradition of making the data public. So none of these frequencies were made public, but of course they did some inference and whatever inference they said they had put it in the paper, but there was no independent way of verifying those things. So it, the first set of frequencies which were actually publicly published was by Librecht and Librecht et al. in 1990. So that was using the data from Big Bear Solar Observatory during 1986 to 90. So that actually was the time when it was really possible to do seismology by using publicly available data. So before that, only people who had the access to the data could do anything. So that was the beginning. So of course, high quality helioseismic data became available only from May 1995, of course, the observation started in May 95. the data was available somewhat later. This was from the Global Oscillation Network Group that is GONG, which is a network of six sites around the world, which began operation in May 95. So a year later, the Michelson Doppler Imager, which is a space based instrument, was also operational. So that was somewhat, so now let us see the next slide. So. Now the first work using this oscillation frequency from TIFR was an upper limit on extent of overshoot below the solar convection zone. So that was in 94. Now during November 95 to February 96, I visited the National Solar Observatory, Tucson, which actually managed the Gong project at that time. Now of course it has shifted to Boulder. So and I also helped them in writing some part of the pipeline for processing the data. Basically, they were stuck at the last step of the program where the power spectrum is fitted to calculate the frequencies because that is a fairly time consuming process. And those days, of course, the computers were not as fast as they are today. So they basically had something ready, but it was taking too long to process the data. So I had to help them and I edited the, I rewrote that part and actually improved the efficiency by more than an order of magnitude. So that allowed the things to be processed and still the first set of frequencies were from Gong were actually obtained from that program. So I, I don't know, I think they are still probably using some version of that. So that was that. So. And of course, the first set of results were published a little later in 96. So the Gong project has actually never released the frequencies of the F mode, which is the fundamental mode, basically, because the noise at that low frequency is pretty high in the Gong data. But anyway, I did calculate this and use them to constrain the solar radius. So that is the story that I will tell you next. So the next slide. So the solar radius, of course, doesn't really pertain to the interior of the sun. So you may wonder why seismology comes there, but that I will explain. So, but before that, let us uh, have a little history of solar radius. So the first measurement of solar radius is attributed to Archimedes. So of course that was long back, but about 2000 years later, the first accurate measurement was made by Picard in 17th century. But the standard value which was adopted for almost 100 years was actually measured by Overs in 1891. That of course in those days, uh, all the earlier measurements were just the measurement of the angular size of the sun because the distance of course 1891 it was known, but before that the distance of the sun was not known, Archimedes did not know. So you can only measure the angular diameter. So this was measured to be 1919 arc seconds, which translates to 695.99 megameters. So that was the standard value of solar radius for almost 100 years. So since then, of course, number of measurements were made and many different values were obtained. And people even found temporal variations in the solar radius of few hundred kilometers. And of course, these claims were all conflicting. Some people found that the radius is correlated to solar activity. Others found it is anti-correlated and some found no variation. So all possibilities were there. So of course it was not clear what is the real thing, but now if you do a little bit of calculation and take the potential energy of the sun, 
and calculate what will happen if the radius changes, then you can easily show that even one kilometer change in solar radius over a solar cycle that is about 11 years would release or absorb energy at a rate which is comparable to solar luminosity. So it is clear that the solar radius cannot be changing by such a large amount. So if, if at all these results are correct, then it will only reflect what is happening at the surface. It will not mean that the whole sun is shrinking or expanding. So that was that. So now next slide. So then I thought that we can do a seismic estimate of the solar radius. So how do you do that? So basically use the F modes, which are known to be surface gravity modes at large degree L. So their frequencies are omega square is given by G into G is the acceleration due to gravity, K is the wave number. So that translates to the formula written on the right side. So as you can see that R is there, but now this R will not be the same as the solar radius because there is, firstly, there is nothing like a solar radius because the sun does not have a solid surface. So the radius depends on what you are looking at. And in this case, each mode will see a different radius because these modes are all trapped in different region and they will see that part as the radius. Basically that happens because these modes will be trapped in a region where the density scale height is comparable to the scale height of the eigenfunction of the mode and the scale height of eigenfunction changes with L. So each L has trapped at a different uh, region and higher L's being trapped at it upper near the surface. So this directly cannot be used to get the radius. So, but nevertheless, we can use the solar model to calibrate this. So that is shown in the next slide. So let us see that. And, uh, Professor Antia, I have a question. Yeah. Can you just enumerate as to how this uh, formulation came for the omega square? So that is a standard theory of surface gravity mode. Now I don't think I have to go to that. That okay. you can get in any textbook. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is a well-known relation. Of course, as far as solar oscillation is concerned, this will not be exactly satisfied because they are not pure surface gravity mode. They are affected by other things also. Yeah, I think Shorbani's talk also had uh, the same relationship. Yeah, that is a well-known thing. But uh, but of course, in the sun, this will not be exactly given by that because right. these are basically acoustic modes, but uh, the effect of stratification is negligible for these modes. They are basically determined by the gravity. So it's, it's essentially some kind of spherical harmonics that you have. Yeah, yeah. this of course, all the modes are spherical harmonics. Terms of spherical harmonics. So the L stands for the degree in the spherical sure, sure. harmonic. Sure, sure. Okay. That, that part holds. So the, another important property of this mode is that in this case, the vertical and the horizontal component of displacement are exactly equal. In the acoustic modes, the horizontal component is smaller than the vertical component. Okay, okay. So now this next slide. So this, the left panel actually shows the ratio omega square by GK. Here G is the surface gravity. So you can, the red line is the quantity for a solar model. So you can see that it asymptotically approaches one, though it has not yet reached one, even at L equal to 1000. So in the blue points are the observed frequencies. So you can see that the observed frequencies are higher than the model frequencies, which means that the solar radius in the model has to be reduced. So the right panel actually shows the same. It is shows the ratio of the observed to the model frequency. So you can see that it is roughly constant. It's something like 1.00445. So that uh, shows that the radius has to be changed by about 0.0003. So which is about a radius change of 210 kilometers because you can ignore the red points. Those are the me later measurements from MDI. It was not there at that time. So this is what I had found in 98. So now this estimate, of course, also depends on, so of course you can say that if you change the solar model, what will happen? So it turns out that there are significant systematic errors. If you change the solar model, you will get a different delta R somewhere between 200 to 300 or 350 kilometers. So there is a systematic error of about 100 kilometers in the measurement. So that of course, so the systematic error doesn't go, but the random errors in this case are very small. And in fact, now you can actually detect the radius correct to less, better than one kilometer. 
so that is the thing but the systematic errors are nevertheless there but this actually opened up the question because so far we have been nobody had bothered about what is the definition of uh, solar radius so let us see the next slide then so as i told the sun is not a solid body so so there is no real unique definition of the solar surface so the observers typically when you measure the solar radius what they do is that they take the limb profile which is shown in the figure so at the center you normalize it to one and it of course comes down as you go away from the limb and at some point it falls very sharply so they measure the point of inflection of course the point of inflection cannot be seen in this scale unless you expand the later part very heavily so that point of inflection is believed to be the surface of the sun as far as the observers are concerned but that is uh, of course at that time nobody had bothered but now it was estimated that that corresponds to a optical depth of about 0.001 so let us go to the next slide to see what the solar models were doing so the solar model of course uh, does not look at the limb profile yeah can you go to the next slide yeah so the theoretical solar model typically observes assume that the solar surface is in a place where optical depth is about unity that is optical depth is as measured from the outside or other the other definition which is most commonly used is that the if you use the stefan's law that 4 pi r square into sigma t to the 4 that should equal to the total luminosity at that point so wherever you define the surface this condition should be satisfied so that also gives so that is the condition which is normally used in solar models that, that corresponds to roughly tau actually slightly greater than 1 but that difference will be only few kilometers so that will not make much difference so this of course is not the same as what the observers used so then what was the difference so this was addressed by these people brown and christensen dasgard in 98 so they did radiative transfer calculation in solar atmosphere and they found that the radius used in the solar model should be about 500 kilometers less than the observed value because we are looking at a surface which is lower down not at the point of inflection what the observers were looking at so now that makes the discrepancy in the other side because now i had said that we need to reduce it by 300 kilometers but now if you reduce it by 500 kilometers then you have to increase by another 200 kilometers or so so now that can be explained in the next slide so that shows an additional complication so this shows the result of uh, structure inversion so basically we can do invert the solar frequencies and calculate the sound speed in the sun and if you do that this delta c by c is the difference between the sun and a solar model so that uh, you can see of course you not bother about the what happens in the interior if you concentrate near the surface these points with the error bars are the actual inversion results so you can see that there is a steep fall near the surface so that is basically because of the solar radius being incorrect because what happens is that in the interior the density scale light or even the sound speed scale light is also pretty large so a small error in the radius will not make much difference in delta c but as you come near the surface it becomes comparable so then of course that makes a difference and that is why you see the steep fall but now of course you will say that okay you can change the radius in the solar model and repeat the thing but that doesn't make too much of difference so the problem is slightly different more complicated than that because basically what happens is that in the solar model of course as i told you the surface is determined by some condition which is satisfied at some point r but there are considerable uncertainty in the solar model near the surface because we don't know how to treat the turbulent convection which is effective in that region so that puts a lot of uncertainty in the solar model so now it happens that even though the solar models agree with the sun in the interior by the time you integrate the equation and come to the surface the boundary condition is not applied at the correct point so if you integrate it properly i mean if you knew the equation correctly and if you did the thing then the boundary condition will presumably be applied at a different point so it turns out that if you actually apply just artificially increase the radius by a factor of 1.00018 
then the this thing disappears as uh, you can see the dashed line in the figure that is obtained by just artificially increasing the radius of the solar model so that uh, sort of explains the remaining discrepancy of whatever about 200 uh, slightly this will be slightly less but of course it depends on which model is used and so on so that sort of proves it but of course the story of solar radius did not end here so let us go to the next slide so now of course it turns out that core data which of course gives all the known constants including the solar radius and all they did not change the solar radius value from what was there for last 100 years and in fact they changed it only in 2015 to 695.7 megameters and of course that they quoted some paper by this laboratory at all they of course quote all our papers and other papers also so it was all based on this work but now of course you can say that what happens to the temporal variation so from f mode frequencies also the conflicting results were obtained about the radius variation and the only thing is the variation was now between 0 to 5 kilometers instead of 500 kilometers so there is an improvement by two orders of magnitude so but of course the reason for this discrepancy is mainly that there are systematic errors firstly in of course as i told you there are systematic errors of 100 kilometers in measuring solar radius but we assume that the systematic errors are independent of time there should be of course good reasons to believe that but apart from that there are also systematic errors in f mode frequency measurement and in fact uh, we had pointed out that there was a strong annual variation in the frequency of the f mode set high value of l so this of course uh, was said it cannot be a solar effect because we can't expect the sun to be affected by the orbit of the earth so that is unlikely to be effect of the so this was actually an embarrassment for the mdi team because they used to think that their frequencies are determined very robustly and accurately but after this was pointed out then of course i of course at that time itself it was clear that what is the source of the variation so the basically what happens is that the solar rotation axis is actually inclined at about 7 degrees to the plane of the earth's orbit so because of that uh, as the earth goes around the sun and of course mdi also orbits the earth so that also goes around the sun around the same way and so we actually see a slightly different range of latitude at a given time so after 6 months later you will see a slightly different range of latitude of course this effect was included in all the pipeline it is not that it was not considered but it turns out that they had not included the effect to sufficient accuracy and that was causing this uh, effect then some years later they improved the calculation and of course the amplitude of the oscillations has significantly reduced but the annual variation is still there so the effect probably cannot be completely eliminated it is still there but of course it is now significantly reduced so now let us see the next slide so that uh, so that is another part of the story so in 2004 this zimbowski and gude see as i told you the solar radius variation cannot be homologous so they said that okay you assume that delta r by r is a function of radius and then also you can have some effect so they they did some approximation and found some relation between the frequency change and delta r by r which is connected by this integral so this uh, was used by a number of people to study the solar radius variation as a function of time and also the depth and of course lots of results were obtained but of course we were very skeptical of this thing so we decided that of course the derivation was difficult to contest because of course many assumptions are always made and it is difficult to say whether it is unreasonable so we decided that we will test it by using some standard solar models with a different uh, i mean with the same radius but a different structure so delta r will be different in the interior and that is shown in so this was done by piali chatterji in 2008 we published this paper so next slide shows the result so you just look at the lower curve the thick uh, solid line is actually the delta nu by nu between the two solar models and the other line shows what is given by the integral 
So you can see that it doesn't even match the variation qualitatively. So quantitative is, of course, a different issue. Of course, since this is a theoretical to theoretical model, there are no errors in this. But the frequency errors in the current MDI measurements are few parts in 10 to the minus 5. So this scale is something in 10 to the minus 4. So it will be still much smaller on this scale. So even within the observed models, this thing don't agree. So, so clearly, so now, of course, uh, we normally measure the impact of the work by look, counting the number of citations. So if you look at our paper that has been cited only twice, because after our paper appeared, nobody published this kind of work. So on the other end, Zimbabwe's case paper has been cited 32 times. So that is the effect of citation. So now let us go to the next uh, story. So, so now, of course, you can say that whether you can do the same thing for solar mass, because solar mass is also not known accurately. Because basically the quantity G is the gravitational potential product G into M is known accurately from Kepler law. But the G or M independently is not known accurately. So, but it, it turns out that the solar oscillation frequencies also mainly depend on the product G into M. So it is not possible to determine either G or M using the seismology. Of course, every solar physicist knows this because it is prominently written in Christiansen Dasgaard's lecture notes. But uh, unfortunately, one very eminent cosmologist tried to determine capital G using seismology. Of course, the result was not particularly great. So that was a disaster. But nevertheless, let us go to the next thing now. I will not describe that. So the next story is about the rotation rate in the solar interior. So the rotation, apart from the rotation frequencies are of course also split by rotation. So by measuring, by using the rotational splitting, we can measure the rotation rate both as a function of radius and theta, that is the latitude. And of course, now we have data over 25 years, so we can also study temporal variations in the rotation rate. Now the temporal variations in the rotation rate at the surface was already known. Which was referred to with various. Yes, sir. No. There is a question from uh, Gopakumar. Yeah, uh, sure. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the question I will ask this later. Okay. okay. Please go ahead. I'm sorry to disturb. Hmm. Okay, so this was known by various names like torsional oscillation, zonal flow, etc. But it is basically the variation in the rotation rate with time. So you can do the same with the seismic data also. So basically, you take the rotation rate as a function of r theta and t is the time and subtract the temporal average at the same r and theta. So that gives you the residual. This has to be done because the temporal variation is less than half a percent. So if you just plot it, you won't see. So that is uh, that needs to be done. So of course, you can also translate that to the rotational velocity by multiplying by r cos theta. So now let us go to the next slide, which shows the result. So this, uh, this is, of course, a more recent result, including data up to 2020. So you can see the bends of, uh, so the, the red or whatever, that part is the portion which is moving faster than the, which has the rotation velocity, which is faster than the average, while the green thing is the velocity which is smaller, slower than the average. So you can see that at a lower latitude, these bends are moving towards the equator. And in the upper panel, this thing is shown the superposed with the position of the sunspot. So you can see that they follow the position of the sunspots. So there is definitely a correlation with the solar cycle. You can use the pointer. You can use the arrow pointer. Oh, OK. Can you see that? Not right now. Can you just uh, move the move the arrow cursor? Yeah, I have moved, but the, you are sharing the screen no? so it will not show. OK. So okay. anyway, so that is uh, doesn't matter. So that, uh, of course, this is uh, not uh, that. Uh, the low latitude pattern was well known, but we actually, for the first time, pointed that the higher latitude, these bands actually move away from the equator. And that we had shown in 2001, where the data was very limited. But nevertheless, it was enough to conclude that this has now been verified. But actually, the more interesting part is there in the next slide. So, so the next slide shows a so this, uh, of course, is the result which was published in Science by some eminent people. 
So what they found is that near the base of the convection zone, which is where the rotation rate has a steep change from differential rotation to solid body rotation, they found that uh, this, if you see the top left panel, there is this looks like a periodic variation with a period of 1.4 years. The black points are the ones which are using gong data and the red are one which are using the MDI data. So they claim that the, both the things are in agreement and hence, of course, this should be real. And there is something happening in 1.4 year period in the Tecocline region. Of course, it doesn't happen everywhere. So there was another problem. But of course, uh, this was not that uh, clear. So if you see the next slide, that actually shows the same figure. I have, no, so yeah, that shows the same figure, except that I have just removed the black part by editing the PS file. So now you can see that the MDI data actually does not show any real periodicity. So that was just an effect of superposition. There was no real periodicity. You purposely, you purposely deleted the actual data to show that there is no, no such I, I, I mean, I will not ascribe any motive. Maybe they didn't realize it. They probably had a superposed figure only. So I don't know. So that was the thing. So anyway, so then of course we tried to repeat the same thing. So that is there in the next slide. Of course, we did not see any, I mean, there is some variation, but it is certainly not periodic. So the next slide shows the Fourier transform of that. So, so that also there are various peaks, the dotted thing is the one which corresponds to 1.4 year period. So you can see that there is no peak at that point and other peaks are definitely not significant because there are many of them at the same height. And of course you can actually find that they don't have significance. So, so this was not a significant result and of course, this uh, remained for about a year or so, but once more data was available, the 1.4 year period went away. So of course that has disappeared now. So we don't have that anymore. So now let us go to the next uh, thing. So that is the, 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 the next story is about the solar chemical abundance. So before that, I can just say a little bit about the helioseismic constraints on the solar model actually demonstrated that the low solar neutrino flux observed at the Earth was due to neutrino oscillation. And this was later confirmed by the neutrino detectors at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. So that was around 2002. But soon after that, this agreement was actually spoiled when Esplund and his colleagues in 2004, they revised the oxygen abundance in the solar photosphere they reduce it by a factor of almost 1.5. Of course, uh, the basically what they argued was that until then all the abundance measurements, see the abundance measurements are done by matching the spectral lines to a profile which is calculated using some solar model. So, so far everybody was using the so-called 1D model, which is a function only of height in the atmosphere. And of course, some parameters are put to model turbulence and so on. And they were adjusted to match the profiles of large number of lines. So that is how the abundances were calculated. But these people said that now we can do a 3D calculation, including the turbulence. So there will be no need to include turbulence artificially in the model. And you can do a 3D model and calculate the abundances. So they did that and they came with a result which was 1.5 times lower than the then accepted thing. And because of that, the, and of course, apart from oxygen, they reduced the abundance of other elements also. So basically the ratio of the heavy element abundance to the hydrogen abundance, which was Z by X, was reduced from 0 0.023 to 0 0.0165. So because of that, uh, this heavy elements actually contribute opacities in the solar interior. So because of that, the solar models obviously will change and uh, they were no longer in agreement with the seismic profile. So that is there in the next slide. So that shows the difference in the sound speed and density between models. The, the one with a smaller difference is the one with the old abundance and the other one is using the new abundance. So it is clear that the discrepancy has increased by more than a factor of five or so. So this was of course not uh, very good. So let us go to the next slide. Now, of course, there were many things who are put forward to explain the thing. But before that, I will say something because basic effect happens that because of the reduction in opacity, the depth of the convection zone is reduced. And this was immediately pointed out by Bakal and Pinsala. 
but uh, then of course we also did some calculation and found that the opacity needs to be increased by about 22% to match the convection zone depth and around that time the independent opacity calculations became available that is the op that is opacity project before that we were using the opal thing which was uh, basically lorentz livermore group calculations so but the difference between the two was less than 2% so that will not explain this of course here i have written that both uh, us basso and bagal both found 2004 both found 22% difference but the actual story is slightly more complicated our paper actually appeared before and our paper was actually accepted when bakal patel submitted the paper and as it happens it came to me for referring so the next slide actually shows that paper so uh, i don't know oh, i think uh, you can probably not see the lower part i ha huh. no, no the, i think the lower part is cut off so if you see if you can read the abstract lower part there they have pointed out that it needs the opacity needs to be reduced by 7% so this was of course in disagreement with us so i was basically asking him to show the model because he had not shown the model after it reducing the opacity by 7 so i said you better show the model with the reduction in whatever change in sound speed etc but of course bakal will not listen to that he said that is a topic of the next paper and this is not here so of course the referee of the i mean the editor of course was not particularly interested in he more or less told me that i should not bother bagal with all these things so the paper got accepted and of course about a month later i saw interestingly it didn't appear immediately about a month later it came on archive so that is in the next slide yeah i think here the highlight is showing so that 7% had become 21% so that of course that is what is the published paper that's why that slide i had shown that so now of course uh, but interestingly editor never informed me that the paper has been modified after its acceptance so that is how it goes but then of course we actually found out what was the problem so it turns out that probably serenely who had done the calculation of course he used the opal opacity tables now this opal tables actually give the opacity in a say log to the base 10 now he somehow thought that it is a natural logarithm so he thought it has modified it by something like 7% but it had actually been modified by much more than that so they discovered that later on and fortunately the paper was corrected before it appeared in the print so anyway the agreement remains so now let us go to the next thing so of course uh, various things theories and uh, various attempts were made to resolve this discrepancy of course the simplest thing was to increase the diffusion of uh, elements inside the sun so that will re reduce z because z the abundance is measured in the surface so if you reduce z interior it will have higher z so basic some problems can be solved but still that doesn't help because along with z the helium abundance also gets reduced so that is independently measured quantity now another possibility was that the sun has accreted some low z material after it was formed so that is a possibility but that also doesn't lead to any acceptable model and we also actually propose that we can improve the neon abundance of course we use neon because neon abundance is one which is very uncertain because other elements which contribute to the opacity are the abundances are less uh, uncertain so that's why we suggested but that also doesn't work because it needs to be increased by a factor of 3 to 4 now that will certainly not be acceptable so finally none of these things actually work so but then uh, what happened is that this triggered lot of activity in measuring abundances so lots of people measured abundances including some using 3d models some using one one day everything was tried and of course everybody got a different result between which was between the explained value and the original value so it is uh, i suppose i have listed some of them here but you can see that there is a wide variation and of course explained himself also revised the estimate and they increased it from 0.165 to 181 but of course that still is not sufficient but now it is clear that the problem is with determining the abundance rather than with the solar models 
It is just that the models are very sensitive to the abundance. So the next slide actually shows the current status. So this shows the sound speed difference between the sun and the solar model using different abundances. So the black line is the original abundance and the lower thing is the original abundance. And of course, the highest thing was the original 2005 abundance of Esplund and colleagues. And the next thing, dotted thing, is the revised abundance of Esplund. So of course, we can consider that as the current thing now, current upper limit, rather. And after that, there are some other things which are revised. And in fact, there is the one which is the Cafu et al. 2010, which is Z0209. That actually almost coincides with the original abundance, although this is slightly lower than 023, but because the relative abundance of different elements has changed, the opacity has changed in a slightly different, it's not proportional to Z because it also depends on the relative contribution of different elements. So that is why that is slightly different, but it more or less same as the world abundance. So basically, if at least there are outcomes. Incidentally, this is also using a 3D model. So the so one thing is clear that the use of 3D model is not the culprit. And in fact, that has been pointed out even before that. In fact, there were other assumptions which were made by Esplund, which are probably responsible for this uh, change of abundance. And this has now been discussed in wide detail, but so far there is still no agreement as to which is the best measurement. So the next thing shows the same effect in density, but we can skip that. So then I come to the, I think I still have some time. So I will come to the last story, which is about the meridional flow. So the meridional flow is the flow in the r theta direction. The rotation is of course the phi direction. So that uh, of course it was predicted that the, because the sun has a differential rotation, the equator moves faster than the pole. So based on that, people had predicted that there has to be a meridional circulation, otherwise this differential rotation cannot be maintained. So that was actually confirmed by the surface measurements. And they showed that there is a flow from equator towards the poles in both the hemisphere. Now, if the thing goes from equator to the pole, there has to be a return flow, because otherwise all the material will accumulate on the pole. So, but uh, the return flow, of course, was not known at what depth it happens. And this is very crucial for the solar dynamo models because the solar dynamo models assume that the return flow is somewhere near the base of the convection zone. In fact, slightly extends to slightly below the convection zone depth. So if uh, the return flow happens much earlier, then of course, the, those models will not be correct. But of course, that was not no, now it turns out that because of some symmetry, the contribution of meridional flow to the global mode frequencies cancel out to the first order and hence so there is no perturbation. So you have to do quasi degenerate perturbation theory and calculate the second order contribution, which of course comes out to be very small. So that was not a very good option to study the meridional flow in the interior. So then, of course, the next slide. So, the, but there are other local helioseismic techniques. So in particular, there is a time distance and the ring diagram. So I will just concentrate on the time distance helioseismology, which is basically similar to the terrestrial seismology, because the terrestrial seismology basically does not depend on the frequency of the modes, but it depends only on the travel time between two points. So the same thing can be done on the sun, and this had been demonstrated some time back. And in fact, uh, Shawn is an expert in that technique. So, so basically, now the figure here on just a cartoon, it shows some cross-section along a longitude in the sun. So you have two points A and B, and if you measure the travel time from A to B or B to A. Of course, if there is no flow happening, the, everything is static, then the travel time will be the same whether it is from A to B or B to A because it will just, re it will just retrace the path. So the way acoustic waves will travel along the same path and there will be no difference in the travel time. So if you take the difference in the travel time A, minus A to B minus B to A, that will actually give some measure of the velocity. For example, if you have a flow going northwards, which is upwards in this figure. 
so from so in that case the wave going from a to b will travel little faster because it, the flow will carry the sound waves with it so that travel time will be reduced on the other end b to a the travel time will be increased so the difference will be non zero so the difference can be used to actually measure the solar time of course you have to integrate over the entire travel time entire ray and that will give you some integral and of course that will basically be an inverse problem which has to be solved so this is the technique which had been which uh, can be used to measure the variation flow but of course there were number of systematic errors so because of that uh, this was not quite successful so the next slide actually shows the first result that was obtained by the zao and the colleague this is they are from the stanford and it includes some well known people so they were the first to find out what is the source of the systematic error of course even today we don't understand it properly but they managed to at least remove something which looked like a systematic error and get something which looked reasonable so they found that uh, this is what they found so the left thing shows the color diagram so basically if you see the upper part you can see that the surface near the surface as well as near the convection zone base which is where it terminates the velocity is in the same direction so which means that the flow reverses well inside the convection zone so if this is true then of course the dynamo models will not be correct and this is more clearly seen in the other figure which is the left to bottom panel if you see so that shows as a function of radius at some different latitude so you can see that there is a change of sign around 0.9 solar radius and then there is another change around 0.8 and then it comes back to the previous sign so that will not be acceptable to the solar dynamo model so this is what they pointed out so of course uh, that uh, did uh, create some issue because of course the dynamo people were not very happy which of course includes our friend arnab rai choudhury because his model also assumes that so now the next uh, slide shows another effort so this was by another group uh, chekevich uh, and they used both gong and hm the earlier result was using hmi which is the helioseismic and magnetic imager that is the latest instrument in space so they found that there is a difference between hmi and gong results so hmi does show multiple cells but the gong does not so that means there is something more complicated happening there so that is the time when rajguru contacted me and he he also had been working on time travel time distance helioseismology of course i had never worked on that so he asked me whether we can do something on that so of course uh, we i agreed that yes it is worth doing so he was so uh, let us go to the next slide so he did the most difficult part of calculating the travel times of this thing using the first four years of hmi data which was the same thing which was used by the zao and others and of course we also improved the inversion a little bit because all the earlier results said only used the theta component of uh, velocity they had not used the r component of velocity but of course the theta and r component are not independent because the continuity equation connects them so we actually introduced the stream function to calculate both the things in terms of the stream function so that we can get both the ur and u theta and of course so that you don't have to ignore it turns out of course that the ur contribution is much smaller so that is not really the real reason for the difference and of course we use some inversion technique and all those things and some improvement in how to calculate the error bars so now that result is shown in the next uh, slide so this is uh, our result so you can see that we don't see we see only single cell even using hmi data so that is a difference in the thing and the left panel shows the radial component so that of course uh, doesn't show any change in sign with depth but it shows the change in sign with latitude as it should so the next thing shows the both the cutouts in the next slide yeah so that is the profile with the solar radius at different latitudes so you can see that the near the surface it was tends to decrease and near 0.9 it does tend to come near zero but it doesn't seem to cross except at some latitude which is within error bars 
and the ritual crossing happens uh, much later around 0.75 hours mr antya yeah so, uh, when you say 2015 or whatever numbers of years you is this all astrophysical journal No, uh, you, this these are this is astrophysical journal, but it may be in different journal, of course. Oh, okay, okay. So you don't is that a convention? I am not given the reference, so okay, of course okay. you can look into the thing and get the references anyway. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, reference of course can be given, but I have not given them. Yeah. So, so that is the thing. So now, so this is uh, of course another thing. So of course, since Shravan had been also working on this, so he. Had of course developed more sophisticated inversion techniques using more sophisticated kernels. So we involved him. So his student Mandel, he Krishnan to Mandel, he did the inversion using of course the same travel times, and of course the results were again very similar. So that was not the result of inversion techniques. So that is there, and now of course the next slide. I think that is the last slide. So. that shows the more recent calculation by gizon and kalish so they used both hmi and uh, gong data and they have found again they also find a single cell which is very similar to our results so now of course this still doesn't settle the thing because the errors are still pretty large and of course there is no you cannot say definitely that this is the final thing but uh, it appears that it is tending towards that and of course the problem if you can see is basically if you see the for example the middle panel at the top and of course the same thing was there in our inversion result also so somewhere around 0.9 there is a change of slope in the profile so that is the crucial point because all these are obtained using inversion techniques and this inversion techniques are basically solution of an i mean ill defined or uh, ill posed problems so of course we have to apply some smoothing to make it reasonable so if you apply slightly larger smoothing than what is required this change of slope can be wiped off and it can cross the axis and it can go to the other side and of course then you will ask why does it come back now that also is expected because if it does cross it will come back because once you see the travel time at a much lower depth because what happens that once you see the travel time at a much lower depth they have a cumulative effect of the entire surface rise from the surface to the that point so if in the if in the middle you have made a mistake then that mistake will have to be over compensated and it will have to be compensated by putting it the other way around there so that is a natural consequence of what will happen if this issue happens of course we don't know whether that is the case but that is the very likely to be the problem and so this will crucially depend on also how the travel times are calculated and how the inversions are done so but of course the final word is not uh, out on this so i think i'll just the next slide i just thank everyone for support during the last 45 years and thanks for your attention Thank you, Professor Antia. Thank you for a very nice. Uh, I request uh, some of you at least could unmute and just clap once for Professor Antia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, colloquium and. i definitely think it's special for professor antia so we'll take questions also so please uh, uh, raise your uh, hand and or maybe unmute yourself and put on your video and ask a question jyotishman may i ask a question yes yes sandeep please please well first of all uh, thank you professor antia that was a very inspiring actually talk about all your contributions and the contributions more generally from tifr in india so i want to thank you very much for uh, the talk and also your your uh, remarkable contributions in the past so many years um i uh, wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, issue you raised about the solar models um and asplund's work and so on which frankly i didn't know about because as a particle physicist uh, we were always told by the solar physicists that the solar model was 
absolutely unquestionably correct and uh, the problem was with uh, neut our understanding of neutrinos and that was borne out because as you said neutrino oscillations were found but uh, now uh, it went by a little quickly what do you feel is the going to be the final uh, resolution to some of the issues in the solar model is it just that the uh, uh, that some of the data will settle down better and opacities etc can you just summarize again it went by a bit quickly yeah so i think uh, i mean see the problem is that uh, if you look at the individual measurements of abundance even the 98 measurement and the exclude measurement they are actually within about uh, 2 to 3 sigma maximum 2 to 0.5 sigma so as such there is no discrepancy in the abundance but the main problem is that the solar models are extremely sensitive to that hmm. And so solar model, the difference will become some 10 sigma or maybe even more than that. Nice. So, so the solar model actually can be used to constrain the abundances rather than the other way around. I see. So because the abundances, of course, they are improving, but uh, the, there are limitations to what the spectroscopist can do because there are too many things, there are problems there. Uh -huh. the measurement of the photospheric abundances. So uh -huh. Of course, it will improve, but I, I am not an expert in that. So I don't know how much it will improve, but it is tending. I mean, at least the differences are, have been narrowed down now. Yeah. Now, of course, the opacity, again, I have no expertise in calculating the opacity. That depends on our understanding of the atomic physics, because these are all calculated theoretically. Mm -hmm. There is no experimental verification of this. Mm -hmm. So but the people who do opacity calculations will not accept that there will be an error of more than about two percent or so in the opacity near the base of the convection zone which is the crucial thing in this so that is unlikely to settle the thing now of course there is a possibility of determining the heavy element abundances using seismology because I, of course, I did not tell because Zarbani had covered that in the last colloquium. As she had pointed out that we determined the helium abundance using the seismology. Mm -hmm. Now, helium, of course, uh, is a, helium was, of course, discovered in the solar spectrum. But helium does not form a line in the solar photosphere because uh, at 6,000 degrees, it is not possible to excite helium atom. So the helium abundance, uh, whatever lines were actually measured in the coronal or the higher level spectrum so that it is more difficult to determine, determine the abundance so that is why helium abundance was very uncertain until 90s so that is where we played some role in determining the helium abundance so now the question is can we do the same for the yes. other elements now in principle that is possible now of course the first problem is that the abundance of these elements is much lower because if you think helium, of course, uh, as far as the, see all these measurements are through the equation of state effect, because the equation of state affects the sound speed, and that affects the, that is what we are measuring. So the equation of state is not sensitive to the abundance by mass, but it is sensitive to abundance by numbers. So if you translate that, uh, the helium abundance is about 0.1 as compared to hydrogen. Hmm not the 25 percent by mass that you are familiar with <laughs> and as compared to that the oxygen abundance which is the third most abundant element is about uh, slightly less than 10 to the minus three so it is two orders of magnitude less than helium abundance nice. so of course it is more difficult to determine that but still i think it is within the limits of helioseismic uh, data but the main problem there is that uh, the equation of state is not calculated reliably for different mixtures. So all the solar models basically use the Opal equation of state. Now that is a state of the art calculation, but they have calculated the equation. They of course use the abundance of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon, which are the main contributors in the convection zone. But unfortunately they calculate it at the fixed uh, relative abundance which is there in the sun so you don't have the equation of state at different relative abundances which will be required if you have to calibrate the models so we actually tried to contact rogers uh, who did this calculation but somehow he was not forthcoming in trying to do this calculation so if those of course we can use other approximate equations of state but then of course the systematic errors are larger 
So the oh. state of the art equation of state, unfortunately, are not available with our different dependencies. So that limits our ability to use helioseismic data. But that is a possibility. But of course, uh, I don't know whether you are following that. But recently, there is some claim by the Borexino group because they are measuring the CNO neutrinos. Hmm. So CNO neutrinos will, of course, be sensitive to the CNO abundance. And if that is reduced by a factor of 1.5, then those will also be reduced by a factor of 1.5. Of course, that 1.5 has now become 1.3 or less. So now it will be more difficult to. So they have recently published some results where I measure that they have detected the CNO neutrinos. But of course, their measurements and errors are still not uh, still very large to distinguish between the different abundances. In fact, their measurement is slightly larger than what the higher metallicity model predicts. So, of course, within error bars, but it is still somewhat large. So, it is still, of course, I don't know how many years it will take for them to reduce the errors to a level that can be distinguished between the two abundances. So, that is. Okay. Thank, uh, you. Thank, uh, thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, uh, Antia, for a very nice uh, uh, explanation as well. Um, uh, Amol, uh, could you unmute yourself and um, ask your question? Uh, the, the, this is also comes from a, a neutrino perspective. So how well do we know the temperature at the core of the sun from the heliosynchronic data? Is it how much is the model dependence? Yeah, that is an interesting question. Of course, that is the first thing Bagal looked at when the abundance was revised. And uh, of course, I think I'm sure it is published in many papers. So what uh, the conclusion was that the, even though the abundance changes the solar model to some extent, but the finally the core structure does not change much because that is because you have the constraint that you have to produce the solar luminosity at the current age. So that constraint actually fixes the core thing. So the most change between the models uh, actually happens near the base of the convection zone. As you, I, even if you remember the sound speed profile, which I had shown in the core, it again comes down. So the core is actually not affected that significantly. So that temperature will not be significantly affected even if the opacities were not, I mean, even if the abundances were not even the abundances were revised. So that part, and of course, the corresponding neutrino fluxes also don't change by much. Of course, the detailed calculations are obviously done by Bakal and his colleagues. OK. OK. Um, uh, thank you, Amol. Um, uh, Gopu, could you ask your question? Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrea, for a beautiful talk and summary of all the results, some of the interesting results. I think we talked about the, um, uh, so the, uh, I know that in 70s, they were trying to get the quadrupole moment of the sun uh, for obviously testing general relativity against uh, its competition. Um, so, uh, I mean, this, all these new models, I mean, that might have put a fairly good constraints on the quadrupole moment of the, you know, sun, which has important implication if you try to use the orbit of uh, Mercury. So. Yes, of course, you are right, and the ciliosismic data did play a role in that, but I did not uh, describe that part. Now, sure. the quadrupole moment, of course, has been determined very precise, uh, accurately, at least within some 10% or so. I don't remember the value, but it is, uh, it is, I think, 10 to the minus 7 or minus 8 or something like that in dimensionless form. So that uh, will give a precision of the Mercury's orbit by 0.03 arc second per century. So that is, of course, well within the error bars of the measurement. So the relativity, of course, holds. There is no problem with the relativity. And of course, not only the quadrupole moment, but even the next J4 also has been estimated. So I mean, and of course, higher order moments also can be estimated, though of course, the errors will go on increasing as you go to higher order. But these things have been estimated. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, questions? Any further questions? No, Anish. Anish, could you? Um... Hi. Yeah, this is Anish. I uh, first just a comment. Um, Antia mentioned about his contribution in the mm. Kong pipeline. 
And I just wanted to mention that uh, I met uh, John Liebaker, who was the leader of the Gong Project, many years later, in uh, maybe around 2012 or so, in a conference. And he specifically mentioned the work that Antia had done there. And he also mentioned that we are still using his pipeline. And it was a great contribution to the thing. So that's just a comment. <clears throat> I have a question uh, for Antia that, I mean, uh, now that, I mean, uh, some of the, I mean, you described some of the major advances in heliosismology over the last 40 years or so. So, uh, I mean, looking forward, what do you think are the main questions that might be answered uh, with new data in heliosismology with the upcoming, I mean, with the present data or the upcoming missions that are planned? See, of course, the two things I already mentioned. One is, of course, uh, first thing is, of course, I'll talk about the larger scale things like rotation, meridional flow, etc., and the solar structure. So in that case, of course, the meridional flow is one thing which is not yet settled. So that is something which, of course, uh, needs to be, uh, which will probably improve with uh, more data. And of course, we'll also probably see the temporal variations in the meridional flow that has already been seen at the surface. And of course, something has been seen even by Gizan and his colleagues. Now, on the rotation part, of course, uh, the near the surface, of course, the things are determined fairly well. But near the tachocline, at least the temporal tachocline itself is well established. But the temporal variation in that region are not quite uh, determined that accurately. And certainly, there is a scope for improvement because that can constrain the solar dynamo models to some extent. Of course, the variations even inside the convection zone also put a strong constraint and I don't think any solar dynamo model actually fully reproduces the zonal flow pattern over the entire depth range. The main problem is that there is a, of course I did not describe that, but there is a sharp change in the phase near the radius of 0.9 and I don't think that is captured by any of the solar dynamo models. So, that is, of course, for the dynamo people to understand, but of course, we also have to constrain those things more accurately. And of course, coming to the abundance, as I already said, there is a possibility of determining the heavy element abundance from seismic data, but that requires better equation of state calculations, which, of course, uh, I don't know if somebody can do that. That will, of course, be a good at least attempt. Of course, I don't know whether that will solve the problem, but at least one can try. So that is there, but of course, on a smaller scale, of course, there are many things which are uncertain. For example, structure of the sunspots, supergranules, et cetera, those things are hardly much, I mean, of course, there are some results, but there are huge uncertainties in that. So those things, of course, we will, of course they will be using local heliosismology, like time distance or ring diagram, but uh, that uh, there, of course, uh, the thing is vast, uh, thing is open. And of course, also in the rotation rate, uh, what we determine seismologically, the seismic determination is sensitive only to the north-south symmetric component of the rotation rate. So the anti-symmetric component uh, by symmetry, of course, if you integrate over the thing, the contribution vanishes. So that uh, it cannot be determined from global modes. Of course, you can determine using time distance and other things. People have done it. And there is some difference there, but of course, there is not a very large difference is at uh, some meters per second as compared to the rotation velocity of two kilometers per second. So that kind of difference is there, but whether that will have any role in the physics that I don't know. That is a different issue. Okay. Anish, thank you very much for your comment, Anish, and your question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, just another quick question, Jyotishman. Uh, uh, do, do you have any comment on the possibility of uh, observing G modes at all? See, the when G the modes, uh, now the thing is that for last 20 years, uh, we have been observing and we have not found any real evidence. Of course, there have been some claims of detecting G modes, but uh, they have not been confirmed. And uh, of course, the, see that, as you know, the noise in the data goes as uh, one by square root of t, the time of integration. So after 20 years now, there is not much scope for improvement there. And I think, uh, of course, you can say with a better instrument, but I, my, of course, I am not an instrumentation person, by, but my understanding is that as far as these modes are concerned, we are already near the solar limit or solar noise limit. So improving the 
instrument may not help uh, very much so we may not be able to determine g modes but there is a completely different possibility and that also i don't know what is the thing i have no expertise in that and that is that lisa may be able to detect this modes so lisa of course as you know is the detects the gravitational waves at millihertz frequency so this g modes will have a frequency of millihertz and they can since they are quadrupolar modes they will emit gravitational waves and people have calculated the gravitational waves from the sun of course of course you will say that the sun is a, not a compact object so the thing <coughs> is very small but then the problem but the issue is the sun is very close by so we have that advantage and of course you know very well that the gravitational deflection of light was first detected on sun eddington did it 100 years back so there is no reason to say that the uh, gravitational wave thing cannot be detected on sun and people have done the calculation and it turns out that the limit of uh, lisa is comparable to the limits that we have on the amplitude from the seismic observation so we still don't know so there is still uh, some chance that it can detect of course there is another major problem with uh, lisa detecting this because so far all the gravitational waves are detected very far off so by that time of course you can treat them as say whatever plane waves or whatever it is but the sun is just uh, 500 light seconds away and the g modes periods are comparable to that so that distance wise also there will be a problem in interpreting the data so that of course i i have no expertise in that okay thank you professor antya for a nice answer uh, uh, kollal da Hello sir, uh, you have raised your hand for a long time. Could you unmute yourself? Hello uh, sir, we lost you. Okay, okay. Uh, Gopu, you have a comment? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've been discussing this with Auntie. Yes, as uh, he pointed out, um, Lisa is not going to see gravitational wave per se. This will be the you know because that's not in the radiation zone as we do in the ligo as you correctly pointed out so this is in the really in the you know strong near zone essentially and the interpretation of that is going to be interesting yeah but the possibility is there um it's just suggested but um, you know this is going to be an interesting if there are anomalies and other things it's, this will come up but explain explaining this in the nonlinear theory is going to be a problematic thing so. okay okay um yes if i can ask yes jyotish uh, ma'am yes okay uh, thanks thanks for allowing me uh, thank you so much for santia for a very nice talk uh, i'm a bit curious to know that so much of study has been made on sun whether attempts were made i'm sure there must be some attempts made to study similar uh you know g type stars and could you find that you know their observations and the results have some significance what we have learned through the solar physics i i i will appreciate if you can comment on that please no, this of course uh, of course the, this has been extended to other stars and there is something called asteroseismology of course historically the solar i mean the stellar pulsations were discovered uh, a few hundred years before the solar oscillations were discovered in fact uh, it was 1596 that fabricius discovered the some star this pulse of course he did not know whether it is pulsating but he saw the variations in the luminosity even without any telescope so that is anyway there so so, so, so the stellar See. oscillations have been known for 400 years and so and in fact uh, they have been used for example cepheids are the well known examples of stellar oscillations and they have of course been extensively used for distance measurement and all so that is also based right. on the same theory now of course uh, if you raise the question of the sun like stars there of course the amplitude is much lower the cepheids as i told you the velocity amplitude is some several kilometers per second so it is easier to find and of course the luminosity amplitude is factor of 2 in some of the stars so that's why you could see it even with uh, naked eye so now the question is uh, for the other stars effort has been made and in fact it is only in the last uh, few decades that 
we have been successful in measuring the thing the biggest uh, of course there have been some ground based measurements also but they were very limited and recently there have been some satellite the first was uh, of course there was a canadian satellite most but that did not give too many results few results were there then there was coro which so the french satellite that measured the oscillation frequencies in some stars and the most successful was of course kepler which studied uh, mm -hmm. which actually observed millions of stars continuously for 3 years so including the some stars uh, so about 500 sun like stars or something of that kind were studied in detail and those oscillation frequencies are actually available and lot of work has been done using that okay now the difference mm -hmm. between the sun and the other stars is that basically the sun of course the main difference is that you cannot resolve the surface so if you cannot resolve the surface you can see only the low l modes you cannot see high l modes because that will require yeah. special resolution so that okay. limits the ability to study the interior but nevertheless many studies have been done thank you, thank you so much thank you kalanda for the question um i okay so i think we uh, sort of uh, i don't see any raise of hands anymore so i would request all of you since i've unshared the screen all of you if you can just uh, flash your video because it will be a nice gesture to professor antia that at least uh, all these people were there <laughs> um and uh, thank you very much for doing the video thing um yes and and uh, um uh, if anybody wants to say anything bhashwati if you want to say anything since you have been <laughs> you have been now the, the Oh, well uh, yeah i think uh, yeah i think much uh, we have already uh, we already know about professor antia's uh, contribution and i sincerely thank him and as shravan mentioned that it will be a we will miss him really yeah. because he was he, he was an immense presence both scientifically and uh, as a colleague uh, we all respect him and i wish him all the best thank you bashwati okay uh, anybody else wants to say anything uh, then otherwise i will close the session with a big round of applause yeah maybe maybe i can yeah uh, yeah go to the yeah yeah so um, you know when i joined uh, uh, tif ever since i joined as tif even when i became faculty and all there was an aura about antia that uh, you know if there is any difficult problem uh, on earth and maybe on the sun <laughs> he he can do it and uh, then of course i learned about student feedbacks to his courses and all and you know, some of them found it difficult uh, to begin with but after they have uh, finished the course most of them said that they have benefited from the course immensely and also from the book of course and today i i, I was really impressed by i mean i didn't quite know what i mean i i, I only knew about the aura but today i'm impressed by you know the the span of his uh, work and the way he has single mindedly you know chased the sun and has learned so much about it i mean it's it's really inspiring so i just wanted to i i thought that i had to say it so um, it was a great talk uh, to santia and um, uh, you know i'm sure you will you cannot but continue this i'm sure you will continue doing this and will uh, again have great uh, you know you, you will have your cumulative h index will keep climbing as uh, shravan uh, said uh, we, <laughs> so thanks a lot thank you um uh, thank you gotamda anybody else who wishes to say something okay well if not then i would like to thank professor antia and have another round of big applause um, for doing this and also uh, i would like to say that um, next week's uh, wednesday colloquium will be the last one for this year a very very eventful year for all of us um so uh, it will be the last one and it will be given by professor pratap rai choudhury who will be discussing some new results on superconductivity from his lab okay um and i wish to now uh, conclude the session thank you all for attending today i'm sure it meant a lot to professor antia thank you okay thanks for all your words okay yes